from Walden University's Career Services Center. Welcome to our webinar, Launching a Career in Consulting. I'm Lisa Cook, Senior Director of Career Services, and I will be welcoming all of our speakers today. Before we introduce our speakers, I would like to introduce our Career Services team. So there are five members of our Career Services team. We're all located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, we have Dina Bergman, our Associate Director and Chief Webmaster and Tech Guru on the left top. We have Angie Lira, our Social Media Maven on the right top. That's uh, one of our Senior Career Service Advisors. We have Nicole Scalzi, bottom left, um, a Senior Career Advisor who manages our webinars. And then um, Denise Pranke, one of our Career Service Advisors who has the really very important job of tracking all of our Career Services Center metrics so we know which of our resources and services are used the most and we can go ahead and expand those. So um, with that said, I would like to turn over our presentation to our career services staff. So I'm going to introduce them. Nicole Skalski, who is our bilingual senior career services advisor, webinar coordinator, and optimal resume manager. And then Angie Lira, who is our social media manager and golden key advisor and website guru. And I just want to thank them both very much for the terrific job that they have done in talking to our wonderful presenters today. We have a faculty, an alumnus, and a student presenter, and they've worked um, very closely with them to bring you this presentation. So thanks to Nicole and Angie and our wonderful speakers. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to them. Angie. Thanks, Lisa. First, we have our esteemed Walden faculty presenter, Dr. Gary Kelsey. Dr. Kelsey is core faculty with Walden School of Public Policy and Administration. He has 39 years of combined experience in higher education, nonprofit organizations, and government. He has 25 years of consulting experience with expertise in nonprofit leadership, board governance, fundraising, program development, and strategic planning. We are very honored to introduce one of our alumni presenters, Dr. Marianne Willicke, who is an independent education consultant and founder and owner of Adaptive Learning. She completed Walden University's PhD in education program this year with a specialization in adult education leadership. She has a passion for developing holistic curriculum to meet the needs of vulnerable adult populations. We also have with us a Walden School of Public Policy and Administration doctoral student, Fred Sahakian. Fred has over 15 years of experience in managing government and nonprofit projects, and also in providing consulting services through his firm, Further Evaluation Consulting. His passion is to help organizations save money by bringing their management and computer systems up to date at an affordable price. Career advisor Nicole Skalski will share Alicia Brooks' recent consulting success story as Alicia was unable to make today's live presentation. Alicia is a recent Walden DBA graduate and business consultant specializing in leadership and finance. And now we will hand the floor over to Dr. Gary Kelsey, who will get us started on our topic of consulting. Hello everyone, this is Gary Kelsey. I want to thank all of you for attending today and I also want to thank our career services staff who've been just amazing to work with in creating this webinar. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to talk about a topic that for me, if I sound very excited about it, it's because I am excited about it, about consulting. It's a profession and a lifestyle that I have enjoyed for 25 years. And so I think it's a great one to explore. Um, as you as noted, I, I, one of the things I want to start with before looking at the definition here or as you review the definition of consulting is um, to think that, think about, I'm also a role, my role is as a full-time faculty in the School of Public Policy Administration and consulting really go a bit hand in hand. Um, my consulting now is uh, more of a pro bono uh, basis because of my full-time role at Walden, but they really do feed off of each other. For, so for those of you who are finishing your degree, you might wonder, would I like to both teach and consult? And the answer to that is yes. I wanted to start out with that because I have had the good fortune of doing both now for quite some time. And I think the, the uh, research, the higher ed uh, exploration at that level feeds consulting and consulting keeps your feet on the ground and really gives you that, that 
face-to-face, day-to-day connection with people and organizations that are important. So it's a wonderful combination. But today we're going to speak about consulting, and we've listed here the, a definition of consulting that I think is, is a good basis and a good place to start from. And you might note that I, I note here pro, uh, in, is an individual who provides content and or process expertise because the, the word consulting means something and nothing to everybody almost. And I think that often it's not just about having an expertise, but it's often about process skills to be able to engage people and work with people to um, come to a goal, to create a project or a project, et cetera. So as a consultant, you would have either content and or process expertise or most likely both. I just want to mention briefly um, a couple things related to the dot points on this slide about what consultants need. It, it is important, of course, that you have in-depth knowledge because you are looked at as an expert in a certain area. And that could be knowledge in nonprofit organizations, in business management, in technology, and many, many different areas. Um, obviously, contacts are important, both for giving work, for staying busy, and for even being able to complete your work as a consultant because you often will need to go out and research resources and work with other people as a part of this process. One of these dot points you'll notice talks about excellent listening, verbal, and written communication skills. And it's so interesting. So many of us that go into this field, we love to engage, we love to talk, we like to be connected to people. But listening is such an incredibly important skill in consulting. When you're a great listener, when you have that first meeting with a potential client or even an existing consulting client, it helps set expectations. It helps create boundaries for who's going to do what and what is the scope of work of the consultant. And it really helps you gain that clarity for success that is so important when you're entering into and continuing to maintain and and sustain the relationship between the consultant and the clients, the groups and the individuals that you're working with. You're probably not surprised to see excellent time management skills listed here because as a consultant you're often spinning many, many plates because you will often have multiple projects going at the same time or indeed as many people do, they may go from a full-time position to a three-quarter or part-time position and then consult on the side and doing that of course then you are spinning the plates of having your full your job and being able to give justice and the time needed for that job and then also to meet the needs of your clients. So time management is, in, is very important. Motivation and self-direction are just vital to being a successful consultant. Um, you have to be the planner, the marketer, a pro project manager, a product developer. There's just all kinds of roles that a consultant plays, and there is no one, um, especially before you you find your client and you engage with them, there is no one giving you deadlines or telling you when things are due. You have to motivate yourself. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind is are you self-directed? And the last dot here, dot point, points to the idea of being flexible and again handling many tasks or projects simultaneously. And flexibility is both a positive and a challenge as we'll see on as we move to the next side. But the flexibility is incredibly important because the job uh, requirements, the duties, the timelines are not always known or it will change often over time. So in terms of what a consultant may provide or do with or work with an organization, and this is just certainly a sample listing of everything that a consultant may be involved in. And again, keep in mind that it's not always about content, but it might be about process. So leadership coaching, you're working with an executive director or a leader in an organization to help them solve a problem, um, work with their employees in a more effective manner to do, create a project or a product, et cetera. So it's process driven as well as content. And I've listed kind of a variety of different um, services and products that might come out of a, a, a relationship between a client and a, and a consultant. Um, my background is most clear, connected with leadership coaching, strategic planning, fundraising, nonprofit board training, again, where you are often called in by a executive director of a nonprofit and perhaps a board chair to work with the board on how can they be in a more effective board or how can they be more engaged in fundraising. And so as consultants we often learn over time that we have certain areas that become our niche and um, 
these are just an example of things that a consultant may provide, but it could be something very, very different as well. I just met yesterday, I'm going to do a pro bono project with a small theater company in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area. And I'm going to work with their board to create a vision for their future and then to create a new mission statement that will help them work towards that vision. So again, it can be varied um, in a wide variety of services and that's what makes it so incredibly fun and engaging and meaningful. We talk about the advantages of being a consultant. Flexible hours. There is no question that um, instead of having to be in an office from 8 o'clock till 5.30 at night, my hours are quite flexible and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing my colleagues who will speak a bit later talk a bit about this, that it's flexible so if I want to go out and have a breakfast meeting or I want to meet someone uh, mid-afternoon for coffee, there's a lot of flexibility to it. Um, and when we get to the next slide, I'll talk a bit about how that's a challenge as well. But the flexible hours is really, um, I think, one of the advantages, but it, it speaks to more of the lifestyle of consulting as well as it is a profession. The increased network and knowledge base, there's no question this is a really wonderful benefit. It's amazing when you work with a wide variety of individuals and organizations how much you learn. In my particular background, because I work in the non, mostly in the nonprofit sector and somewhat in government, that I have learned a lot about theater, I've learned a lot about social justice, about the environment, about um, social services and human services and community organizing, and it has really been just an amazing on-the-ground educational experience. And that is just meaningful um, and adds so much to, I think, who we are as people as well as professionals. Ability to work with a variety of clients and projects, that goes along with what I was just talking about. That if, if you're the kind of person who in your, you enjoy your job but you think, you know, wow, I'd like to work with more people in the field of theater or in music or in uh, nonprofit organizations, but I would enjoy getting to know and work with people in a variety of settings, this really may be a field for you because uh, it, it does give you that exposure and that kind connection to people that can be quite amazing. The next bullet point is an interesting one, control over workload and clients. Uh, again, that's, that's both a positive and it's a challenge, as you can well imagine, that you can decide whether or not to take on a client or a, a job. If I get a request to do something, um, let's just say to do a training with a group in an evening or a weekend, which is now when I mostly do my consulting, um, I will look at my schedule, I'll look at my other duties and what I'm already committed to, and I have control over whether I say yes or no. I also have a control over the content of, of what the potential client is asking for. If it's something that is really a niche for me and that I feel confident and, and good about, indeed, that might be something I very, with great excitement, would choose. But for instance, for me, even though I work with nonprofits, I am not, uh, I do not have the expertise in the financial budget area. So when someone said, I'd like you to come in and work with us in that area, I generally would refer that individual then to some other consultants that I know who have expertise. So you do have that a sense and a level of control over your workload and clients and that even goes for geography as well. Sometimes you get to travel to some wonderful destinations and you can make choices um, based on what comes your way in terms of uh, potential clients. The ability to determine your own income. Um, income is flexible and that on the positive side or on the advantage side I think that that if you're an incredibly hard worker, that if you do a good job at your um, promotion, your, your marketing, if you've got a great um, reputation, um, then you have an ability to make a, quite a good income consulting. You know, that can take time over the years. I know for my own um, consulting work, workload that I started out at a much lower rate than I am now, but I also, as I'll note later, will do things on a sliding scale or pro bono basis, uh, which is important too. But the income is, uh, is uh, really kind of up to you, depending on how much you want to work and how much you are able to access work and find work and uh, hopefully let your network work for you. Consultants do face many challenges though. The flexibility is, is uh, also, it's a, a, a two-sided coin, if you will, that while flexible hours um, can be great, it also may be necessary to work lots of evenings and weekends and that you're going to meet the needs of the client. 
And if you're doing that, that doesn't always happen between regular business hours, or it often doesn't happen, in my case, between those hours. And so that's something that you have to really be willing to, to uh, address and be okay with. Uh, clients who are not clear about what is needed, what I mean there is that sometimes when I've gone in to talk with a client who will just say, let's, let's have a cup of coffee to talk about your training needs with either your staff or your board, I will ask them questions about that to say, what do you think you need so that I can try to get a better understanding of what they need. However, what I find sometimes is that when they, for instance, in an organization that is really having um, issues with with conflict among staff or conflict with a staff or a board member, they want to have training around board and staff roles, but really what they need is client, uh, I'm sorry, is, is conflict management skills. In that case, you have to be really listening well and to be able to be clear about this is what I'm hearing and here's what I'm going to suggest versus perhaps what you've initially presented to me. And in that way, again, we can give our clients the most benefit that we can and be a really good resource for them. But sometimes they're not clear about what they need and we have to work with them on that. Otherwise, we may provide something that is not going to ultimately make a difference for them. Uh, all as related to that, the clients sometimes not knowing what they need or how much they need, they may request um, additional work then and that comes um, in addition to what you've agreed to. So they may say, can you come and make this presentation or can we have this additional meeting um, on a certain evening? And so that's a challenge that consultants need to face is to set boundaries, but also to know when to be flexible. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, your workload may vary. At times, I've been fortunate that um, I had a steady workload for most of my consulting career, but it can go up and down. There are times it may be slow and there may be times that you're very, very busy and an individual has to be willing and able to work with that. Um, uh, inability to predict income goes along with that, of course. And so I always say you need to have some cash reserves in the bank, um, which would be very like any organization would, um, to make sure that if there is a slow time that you have the cash to be able to pay your bills and to be able to operate in a, in a fiscally sound manner. Isolation is an interesting one. That is really important. And in my research and talking with other consultants, I find this is the number one reason why people do not stay in consulting. It's not lack of income. There's the fact that they feel very, very alone at times, especially if they work in their office at home alone versus being part of a consulting firm or a group. And so while that's a challenge, it's certainly not a challenge you can't overcome. I know for myself is that I have a great network of people that I meet with, other clients. I do a lot of volunteer work. I sit on a lot of boards, make sure that my network of family and friends is current and that I'm being proactive about that. But sometimes you don't have somebody that you can walk down the hall and say, hey, can I run this idea past you? So isolation can be an issue, and you might want to think about that as you think about going into this profession of do I work best in a team or can I work well by myself if I have access to people in my life that can be helpful or supportive of me. So now looking at what kind of industries or in what settings um, are consultants hired, you'll notice on this slide lots of different settings and it is really varied. It can be incredibly varied. There is, I can't think of a field that wouldn't necessarily possibly use a consultant. Um, in education, for instance, one of my close friends recently went into consulting, and she's an expert on accreditation, Higher Learning Commission accreditation, and she has now had a very successful career, even though she just began, working with other universities who are facing um, visits and their accreditation visits, and she helps them prep for those visits. In the nonprofit sector, you may find that there's a lot of need for fundraising consultants or people who are very um, interested in having someone come in and help them with their special events, either marketing special events or fundraising special events. But all kinds of industries, there's probably no limit on the kind of industries that really would hire consultants. I've worked with associations of builders, I did work with McDonald's, a little bit of work with them, and just a wide variety of organizations. So now when you're thinking about what should I really consider in addition to what's already been said um, when thinking about do I want to do this, obviously the first question is am I qualified? Do I have enough experience and expertise <laughs> that I could offer up my services and myself as a consultant? What are my unique skills or special skills that perhaps I've owned in a particular area? 
as I mentioned for myself, I tend to focus on nonprofit leadership, board governance, the role of the board in fundraising, fundraising in general, and nonprofit strategic planning. But I've also done a lot of retreat facilitation. I've done some conflict management work and team building with um, staffs and boards, et cetera. So what is, the, what is your unique background that makes you qualified to become a, a consultant? Why would someone want your skills is a question I always I say, I tell people to ask themselves. Again, your track record. Do have you? Do people know you? Have you been in the field long enough, where you have enough depth and breadth of expertise? Um, you know, have you perhaps done some volunteer pro bono work? Or, um, do you have? What is your degree? And does your degree lend itself to that credibility? Are you published? Um, have you been a speaker at conferences, etc.? Um, those are all important things to keep in mind. Are you able to compete? Again, how many other folks are out there doing what you're doing? At what price? In what kind of a niche? Um, I find that most successful people that I'm aware of have really found that there are not a lot of people doing exactly what they're doing, so that they are someone who is a go-to person for a particular organizational need. Your network is incredibly important, and I suspect uh, my colleagues on the panel will talk a bit about this, that do you have a network of people that will give you your referrals, will help you find potential clients, that will recommend you. When I left my full-time job in a nonprofit organization many years ago, I was hired back by that organization to do my first consulting training, and then someone at that training asked me to work for their organization, and then that led to other jobs. So the networking is incredibly important and certainly folks at Career Services know a lot about networking. They're, that's an incredibly um, great uh, skill that they all have. The business plan, you know, again, if you're doing your business plan, I did not, I have to admit, I did not start with a business plan. I probably should have, but I think that that's a great idea so that you know how to move this forward as a business because it is your career. If you are currently working in an organization or a business, a company that does allow you to do some consulting, even as a full-time uh, worker, you know what are the restrictions on that? What are their expectations? Do they have a conflict of interest policy that you must adhere to? You know, if we're, are you able to perhaps go from full time to three quarters time or half time in your current position to give you a base of income while you begin to create a consulting pool, if you will, and a client pool? And what are their feelings and their policies related to that? That's very, very important because if you're, if you're transitioning or if you're currently working full time but you want to do this as a side business, you want to make sure that you give your current organization everything it deserves in terms of your time and expertise and um, your motivation. And I think I mentioned before about the having finances in reserve. I do find that is really important because um, there are slow times. You might compare this even with being in real estate several years ago during the downturn in the real estate. Uh, business. A lot of people, the people that survived are those that had set aside money until the bu until business and the economy picked up. The same is true with consulting. Um, after a while, I think you'll find that uh, marketing is less important because more of your work will be from referrals or from people who will want you to come back and work with them again. I've worked with one organization and have done their, their strategic planning process um, five times now. So I've worked with them over um, 15 to 20 years. And so that kind of repeat business is great as well as getting referrals from existing clients. In terms of setting up the business, again, these are just some of the steps. Uh, naming your business, of course. You know, what's going to keep you kind of up front and in front of people and will help them remember you. Registering your business. I am personally a sole proprietor, so I am not um, I am not registered in another form or format, but that's something certainly to look into. And listed here are some folks who can help you, who can provide support related to the startup business aspect, perhaps an attorney. Again, technology, business software. I have a wonderful accountant who's helped me with um, both retirement issues and uh, taxes and those kind of issues. Do you need insurance? You know, how much risk will there be in the kind of consulting you do? Are you working with vulnerable populations? That may help you think about do I need a special insurance or not? So let's then talk about, about marketing the consulting services. This is an important one is who is your market? 
Who's going to need your services? Um, who can you go out and talk to about your services? Sometimes people don't know what they don't know. And so sometimes meeting with someone who doesn't know a lot about planning, organizational planning, um, you know, you may have a cup of coffee with them and ask questions that relates to their planning, especially if they're telling you that there are issues related to their ability to move forward or to really um, make their mission come to life and to reach towards their vision. And so you may say, well, have you ever thought about doing strategic planning or another kind of planning? So who's your target market? Who could really use your services? I think creating a marketing plan is a great idea. It can be a very simple one if you're just starting out, but a great tool. And again, what are your marketing materials and your approach? Are you, of course, going to have business cards, a website? Are you going to write a blog? Are you going to create a brochure? Um, are you going to have a booth even at professional conferences? And are you going to sponsor, maybe be a sponsor of some kind of projects or community programs or conferences to get your name out there? Marketing is important over time. It continues to be important, but as I said, hopefully if you do great work and have a great reputation, um, word of mouth becomes your primary source often of referrals. How much should I charge? The real practical question. Um, I'd like to start this by saying this is a great place to start talking with people that are already in consulting. Do informational interviews. I did that when I started many, many years ago. And I talked with, with existing uh, consultants and said, how did you get into this? How did you kind of nail down your expertise and be able to document that? How do you charge? And I, I learned a ton from working with them. But a question again, what is your time and expertise worth? Um, and that's where these information interviews can help find out what other people are charging. You will find there's a wide range of, of um, income and charges and fees that consultants will ask. And again, it can go from pro bono to sliding scale all the way up to a significant hourly wage. So you have to figure, especially if you're beginning in this, what makes sense for me to provide, what is still going to help me make a living and be appropriate and communicate expertise and yet still be affordable. I work mostly in the nonprofit sector and the nonprofit sector is the small to medium sized organizations and most of them cannot afford a consultant in the same price range as perhaps a large organization, for profit organization could. And so I price accordingly and you can still make a very fine living. How will you bill for your services? Um, are you going to charge hourly fee? And again, some of these may depend on the project. Are you going to have a project fee? In other words, if you're going to do a strategic planning process and help them write their plan, you know, are you going to charge one fee that will include all of the meetings, the prep for the meetings, the content, the facilitation, and then helping them create the final product? Or are you going to do that on an hourly basis? Or a retainer where they would say for X number of dollars, let's just say $1,000 a month, I will come into your organization and I will look at, you know, work, help you work through your marketing plan or help you create and implement this new product or service. And there may be other ways that you can charge. I have some very small nonprofit organizations I've actually bartered. At a retreat center, I said I will run some staff, some staff retreat sessions if I can stay at one of your retreat cabins for a couple of weekends for free. And that's a wonderful way to work. It's a win-win for both you and the organization. So be creative there. And a lot of it depends on your life and your lifestyle. But that can be... Um, uh, flexible certainly as well. And again, I noted this, uh, will you provide services on a sliding scale or pro bono basis? In my mind, that really speaks to the mission of Walden University, which is social change. And to me, um, especially given that I am a core faculty member at Walden University, my consulting now consists of, of evenings, weekends, and vacation time consulting, and I have set for myself a goal of 25%, if not more, need to be free or at a sliding scale because I think it's so important to give back to the community that has given me so much um, in return. And so um, that's something that you might also want to consider, especially as you're starting out, to get your name known and to be able to establish yourself. So I hope that provides a good foundation for the speakers that are coming, and I'd be happy later to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Gary. That was wonderful. Um, now I am very excited to hand it over to our first Walden presenter, Marion Willicke, um, who will share a bit about her own consulting experiences. Marion. Thank you, Nicole. I was just out of grad school 10 years ago, 
and frankly, I assumed that I would be getting a job in a university, but I really didn't know many people in my field, so I didn't even know how to go about it exactly. But I saw that my undergrad's alma mater was doing a mini conference on education, which was my field, so I thought this is a great opportunity. So I picked a topic that was a hot topic at the time, 10 years ago, it was hybrid learning, and I really made this my golden moment of opportunities, what I was really aiming for. And it worked out because as a result of that conversation, I was able to have several discussions with different people who had attended that session. And like I said, I had expected a full-time offer, but a couple of people offered me contracts. And I hadn't even really considered that before, but then I was like, that would be a really appealing career style. I love the flexibility. I like to travel. I, I really hate getting up early. So I decided to give that a shot. I picked one of the long-term contract options that was provided me, which was a two-year instructional design contract to develop their associate and their bachelor level online programs. So I found that these two years of the contract were really crucial for me. Uh, in one way, I found that there was a large gap between the tidy theories that I learned from my masters and the reality of life. And then I also learned that if I was to succeed, I really needed to be innovative. This learning process over these two years earned me a director role at that same university, so I shifted for those next two years as a director of online education. By the time we hit 2010, I decided to start my own consultancy while I was doing the job of uh, online director. And my, the consultancy that I developed was working with other universities, specifically with adult learning and online platforms, because up to then, that was really where I had um, built my expertise. Like I said, I kept this on the side, though, because I, I was earning enough money to go it alone, basically, but I really didn't feel like my learning experience as a director had ended. And I had subsequent roles as director at that same university of academic operations and then later a director of humanities. And these roles especially gave me some amazing insights that make me a better consultant, which is what I only do right now. And I think I'll probably keep it that way. I would say that the culmination of my growing self-awareness when I was in doing my doctoral journey, my experiences working with those different clients in my earlier years, and the director level work that I had done really led me to be extremely focused in three areas that included curriculum design, how adults learn, uh, specifically train the trainer focus such as uh, coaches, instructors, and faculty, and then how to work with academic coaching for underprepared learners. Four books that I really want you to be able to be aware of, if we're if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, is about personal Kanban. It's it's, it's about mapping work. Uh, Dr. Kelsey had mentioned uh, the value of time management, and this book really encapsulates that. The Secrets of Consulting, Networking, and then the last one is about marketing and finding your niche. And I found all of these books absolutely must-reads. If you decide to go down the path of consulting or if you're considering it, I would invest probably the four, I think it'd be about 40 bucks for all four of these books on Amazon to to read these books and what, what to really get across um, when it comes down to these five points that I have I have made on this slide is the broad experience uh, portion of this I had probably done anything that was slightly related to my field I mean anything I dabbled in a lot of different areas and I experienced a lot but I got really focused the more I practiced uh, I found things that I really loved and I, I honed in on those you're going to, if you if you uh, continue down the path and decide to be, become a consultant, then I'm sure you will end up in a niche that you love, just probably to stay, stay sane in your career focus. But I just wanted to bring this out because it is such an important, important journey of developing context. So as consultants, we are experts in a particular field but we always are responsible for seeing the big picture when working with our clients. Regarding the balance of models to use with context of your client needs, 
there's a great phrase that I always keep in mind when I work with clients and that is what's in it for me and I don't mean that towards me as a consultant I mean it for them what can I do for them that helps them understand what I can provide for them and that really helps me make sure that I tell them enough of a model or a process or whatever the situation is that they understand the why of my recommendation but I'm keeping it extremely relevant to what their needs are. Seeing each client as unique is pretty obvious but it can be really tempting to take a solution that worked really well at one client and just plug it into another client and uh, my experience so far is showing me that that doesn't particularly work very well. You really have to appreciate the nuances of every client's vision and your job when you initially start working with any client is to listen, listen, listen some more. You always have to be aware of, of what they are saying. Networking is incredibly crucial. I can say that um, in my working with conferences, I, I speak a lot, I attend a lot, and every single one of my contracts, um, everything from the very small to the very large, have been a result of a networking experience within a conference. So that is just my particular preference, but my point is it's the face-to-face -face working and networking with other people that is so helpful. I mean, yes, we network in social media and that's very important, but that face-to-face -face really helps develop concrete relationships. So attend those small conferences, speak at them. Uh, I would recommend starting small for speaking engagements and then just build up as your confidence grows. The real value here is to get your name out, and in my opinion, the most important truly is to meet people that have shared values and develop goals with them. A lot of projects I've worked on have been from meeting people and getting excited about things and, and completing goals together. And then my last but not least piece of advice is to have a professional do your marketing and branding if you are not experienced in it yourself. If they're just trying to whip up a website for you and you've hired somebody and they're not trying to understand who you are, I would not work with them. I recommend finding somebody who is interested in understanding who you are, what your goals are, what your vision is, and that branding experience will have a subsequent website emerge that really reflects who you are and, and your values, and it's those values that are going to connect clients to wanting to work with you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mary. And that was very insightful. And we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. And Marion's actually walking the talk because she just um, is attending a conference out in Europe and uh, just presented a, a talk this morning, European time, as we speak. So with that, I will hand it over to Fred Sahakian, our next doctoral student presenter, and he's Management and Technology Consultant. Uh, take it away, Fred. Hello, everybody. Thank you for this uh, amazing opportunity. It's been a great presentation so far. Um, I started my career in consulting um, over 15 years ago. I was in an, in an electronics store, and there, was, uh, uh, there were two people trying to buy a computer. And they were asking uh, the store clerk for some advice, and I was overhearing the conversation, and the advice was just wrong. <laughs> and so when the clerk walked away, I approached these folks, um, and I wasn't consulting at the time. And I said, folks, you know what? You know, I've been doing this for a while, and I think this is what you need for what I, what I heard. And so I got into a dialogue with them, and I, one person spoke turned to the other and said, um, ask him if he can teach you how to do this stuff. And so in that moment, um, I started my consulting. Um, and then at the time, uh, I was passionate about technology as I am now. And so I started working one-on-one -on -one with this person. Um, she had a, a, a small business. Uh, she was a, a, a sole pro proprietor, um, but she dealt with very large organizations. And so over the next few years, my, my focus at the time was, was tech, and I started growing from there. And through the encouragement of, of family and friends, they, they knew me. They knew, you know, when Fred went home after work, 
Um, I stayed up to the early morning hours learning, creating, and I was immersed in, in, in my passion, which was, which was tech. Um, and 15 years ago in tech, the internet existed. Everything was around. And, and, but people um, I could identify were still trying to learn things um, at, different, at different levels. So I started looking into, into the process. And um, I became a, a, an LLC, um, I, which is a limited liability company. I, tried to, uh, I started learning about um, managing finances. Um, and, and a few of my colleagues already have talked about how to charge folks, trying to understand what you can charge, what folks are willing to pay. And, and you sort of start identifying and re relating to folks that you're going to be helping others who are experts in their own field but they're not experts in what you know. So that's one of the keys. And so the question I started asking myself and when I meet with, with folks is, what do they need? What is their big problem? What do they need solved? Many times folks run into the, I just need to know quickly how to fix this, but they don't want to engage or they don't understand how to engage in identifying what is really the big problem. And so that's where I started coming in, especially with, with technology products. And you start learning um, what folks are willing to pay. So it's sort of a growing process. And as I started growing and I was starting my, my career and I was working, um, I started out really identifying where my market was. And for me at the time, again, my market started with small businesses and they needed help. And what I started realizing the big lesson was these relationships that started to build with, with time. And the relationships are one of the, the key things um, that is the reason why you start getting that repeat business. And the, the small businesses I was working with happened to me, um, my academic, my professional and, 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 and personal um, philosophies, which is uh, positive social change, which also falls into the Walden, Walden criteria as well. And so small businesses then started referring me to their, to their clients who were nonprofits. And so there were smaller nonprofits. And so there was this constant growth and clicking. And so it, it was like a little community that started being built. So you, you, I was working with a nonprofit and I knew there are other consultants. And so it started becoming a lot of problem solving. So that's how things started with me. One of the things that also I did was an important thing was I started developing, which was one of my hardest things, was <clears throat> develop your 30-second elevator talk. So when you meet someone for the first time and they ask you, what do you do? You got to figure out what are you selling? What do you offer? How do you, who do you offer it to? And how well do you do it? And these are the things that are very important to be able to speak to people about when you meet them, for the, especially for the first time. So I'm very passionate about this. I'm very passionate about people. And one of the key things is networking is incredibly important. So I join associations. I do a lot of online work. Um, LinkedIn is, is, is a big thing right now. And the key thing is, um, some of the key things that have worked for me is having a sense of humor, especially when you're working with clients. Be genuine. Be humble. Understand your limits. Don't, don't over-promise things. Um, that can, you don't want to over-promise things and not deliver. Because, I, as Dr. Kelsey said, word of mouth is key to continuing your relationships and building even more, um, more clientele for your portfolio. 99% of my clients are involved in positive social change, which, which really is, it's, it's amazing. Um, I'm learning so much and growing in so many different ways. And as, as my career continued, um, I'm, I was able to add, tech, uh, in addition to technology, I was able to add my management experience in solving big problems. So my management experience was able to, is able to help nonprofit organizations grow their, their management teams or help their management teams or operational things, how to streamline things. And some of it is technology and some of it is management. So my passion grew and, and it's all working together. So one of the, one of the big things that, that I like to talk about is, is how has Walden um, and my education helped me? So from, for myself, um, uh, there's a course I took a, a while ago and uh, it was called the, the Mind Gym. And it was this really out of the box thought thinking course. And what I loved about it is it was about solving problems and talk about the last thing, the last step you can try is eat chocolate. You know, when you've tried everything to solve some problems, eat some, eat some chocolate. 
And so um, I did that one time. I was working with a with a group. I was consulting, and we were having they were having some challenges, and I was trying to guide them through the process. And we were, I was about to enter a really tough meeting for them. They were just, they just couldn't get along and, and they couldn't solve some problems. So I brought in a bunch of chocolate and I put it on the table and said, let's just all talk about anything but business. And so folks were breaking the chocolate and sharing it. And um, when the meeting ended, um, the, the manager came over to me and said, you know, Fred, that is the first time that these folks really just got to talk as normal folks. They have no bonding experience. They're working silos. So there are little things that I really uh, enjoyed about Walden. It's, uh, the PhD program has helped me really think outside the box, how to really follow problems, um, identifying research and science and practical proven ways of, of, of improving things. And a lot of that happened on the East Coast. And when I moved out here to the West Coast, where, where I live now, um, I needed to continue a lot of my consulting work. And so I was doing some marketing online and, um, and talking in some groups. And I met, a, I met a gentleman. And this gentleman has been in his industry for over 25 years. And it was just like when I started my career back east. It was, it was just this moment of we just had a conversation. And he knew exactly what his expertise was. He'd done it forever. And he just needed a little help. So when you know yourself and, and you just have that ability to relate to people and communicate to people, um, I think that's one of, one of the key things. But it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Um, and uh, my colleagues here have really um, said a lot of things that have been spot on. Um, and uh, on my next slide, I do have some just some basic resources um, that are great. Um, project management is a big thing. It's a passion of mine. I love to use something called Toodledoo. It's free. Um, uh, there's another one called Liquid Planner, which is not on the slide, and I just remembered it. it. It costs additional money, but if you have an education account, you can get a free account. You have to look on their website. It's called liquidplanner.com. So if you have an EDU account, I think they give you a free account. Um, sometimes you don't want to give out your, 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 voice, your phone number, so Google offers, offers uh, free phone numbers. And a book called Branding for Dummies um, uh, is a really great book. Um, Barbara there, I, she, she's in the Bay Area where I, where I live, and Barbara um, has come out to a few groups and actually donated her time to talk to folks to not just promote her, her book, but she's been talking to nonprofit groups and, and other groups to help them in this, in this way of branding. And as I mentioned, I became an LLC early on, and for, for me it was, it was something I wanted to do to incorporate my business. And these are all things that I've either read or, or used. So thank you so much for this opportunity, and I really encourage everyone to, to, if you're passionate about this and you have something, just go for it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fred. And I also want to share um, quickly another Walden Consulting success story about a recent DBA graduate, Alicia Brooks. Unfortunately, Alicia was not able to make it to the live webinar today because she's actually currently working in the Caribbean on one of her very first consulting projects. And she also completed her MBA with Walden. So Alicia made a career transition. She was uh, working as a billing quality control coordinator and she is now actually this year become a business development consultant. She helps her clients develop business strategies with a focus on leadership and finance, which was actually also finance was a part of her DBA specialization. Well, how did Alicia make this transition? She really, her success story is through networking with the Walden community. She really made an effort through her residencies and her online classrooms and she stayed, not only met and exchanged business cards with these people, but she made sure to stay in contact with them through the course of her program. And she also provided um, value. So providing value to her network by sharing ideas, strategies, information, um, connecting with them face-to-face -face at residencies, online, through doctoral Facebook groups as well. And at her second residency in Atlanta, uh, she was actually coaching and mentoring a fellow student with their doc study. And this partnership actually led her to be recruited and invited to become a quote unquote standby business consultant in St. Lucia to develop uh, leadership training for a local hotel down there. 
So then she was then scheduled to return again um, on this project, and the hotel manager actually uh, asked her to become the backup consultant when the other woman was not available. So, you know, through word of mouth and referral and mentoring and networking and staying in touch with others, um, Alicia was able to launch her consulting business and make that uh, happen. So we're um, really proud and thank you for Fred and Marion and Gary for sharing all your stories. And with that, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. So I'm going to go in and check the questions that are coming in. Great. Okay. Um, Nicole, um, it seems as if several students have talked about how to market and how to do research to figure out who their target market is. And I know there were several resources that the presenters mentioned that were really helpful with marketing, but any tips beyond um, you know, some fantastic resources and books that you'd want to advise students to use as they determine who their target market is to launch their consulting business? This is Gary. I don't have um, a book in per se, but I'm thinking that one of the skills that all Walden students should have is knowing how to read the literature. And this is, again, consulting and, lit and, uh, and being a scholar have a lot of close alignment and tie-in. And so I would find professional marketing um, organizations in your area, marketing magazines, et cetera, and study. Um, look at those to get a sense of who's out there. There also may be some local consultant support groups or consultant groups in your area that you could start attending and to learn more about, are there other people in my field? Uh, is there tons of competition in this particular area? And maybe find two or three or four of those people do informational interviews and ask them what has been your, what has been your competition, if you will. Uh, that has been, for me, the most helpful is to find other organizational development consultants and talk to them. Great. And there was another question about how to determine fees. Is there a range of fees for nonprofit consulting? And also, does one benchmark their consulting fees according to the area in which they're doing their consulting? Well, one, one area that um, I, I do know that I, I've done and a few of uh, my colleagues have done is uh, sometimes you base it on the, the budget size of the particular nonprofit. So if the budget size is under a million dollars, you may have you know a sliding scale. Um, so as their budget size increases, the, the, the assumption, I guess, is that they can afford a little bit more. And as Dr. Kelsey said also, um, pro bono um, work really helps as well sometimes, regardless of the size. This is Marion. Is Fred is absolutely right. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to mention, I have two types of clients. One is academic and one is corporate. My corporate scales are exponentially higher than my academic scales simply due to affordability and I want to support learning. So it just depends on who you're working with as well. And to build on my colleagues, sometimes I will ask a client, do you have a budget set aside for this project? Let's just say it's strategic planning. Do you have a budget? And if they say, well, I've got this amount of money, you can say, well, for that, I can facilitate the process, but maybe you would do all of the writing up of the document, and I'll just review it. So you can be kind of flexible with that. I also find, uh, as someone working with small to emerging and medium-sized groups, that they can't afford as much as others. So I, I really want to be sensitive to that. But you'll find a, a rate range, since the question was asked about range, I see a rate range of anywhere from $80 an hour to $350 an hour. But you can make a fine living even at the lower end of that range. And again, you may bid by project is another way to do it, so it keeps the cost containment. Another thing I often tell folks is, you know, is there a foundation that can give you a capacity building grant that will pay for the consultant to come in and do the training, do the the um, strategic planning or whatever the service may be so that the foundation is paying for this. Many foundations will, will fund these efforts in organizations and they call them capacity building or capacity management building grants. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Another question, is it recommended to have, excuse me, a degree past a master's degree in order to be effective as a consultant? No, you need to have communication skills and empathy skills. 
Agree, absolutely. Um, and I agree, no, it doesn't have to be. I think it can help in some cases, but it, it uh, does not have to be. I agree. I want to add, you have to be able to build great professional relationships. Great. Thank you. Um, and then um, a student asks, um, their previous background is in education, and they are currently finishing up a PhD in public health. So how does a student rebrand to put um, their educational skills and health education promotion experience um, to work so that they can rebrand themselves as a consultant. I guess that could apply to any type of rebranding activity, not just um, health education promotion. I, th I think the, the key is, is really how you present yourself. Um, and in, in, I would say in any industry, you, you're solving problems, and, and I think that's one of the key things of consulting is you're, you're helping your clients solve their problems. So if you can get the message across that you, you, you can indicate what you're selling, what you're offering, and how do you offer it? How are you going to help them? What's their problem? What's the action you can take, and what results can you give them? Um, and, uh, and as my colleagues mentioned, is you may not be able to do everything from A to Z for, for those folks, but be flexible enough to, to be able to say, heck, I can do this for you, and they'll hire you. Great. Well, that's wonderful Thank advice. You. Terrific. Great. Another student um, would like to be a fundraising consultant to assist nonprofit organizations with raising money for a certain cause. Do you have any tips or suggestions on how to start to do that? I can address this one because I have I am a fundraising consultant. Um, first of all, I would join Association of Fundraising Professionals (AFP) if you haven't done so already. Um, there are lots and lots of fundraising um, consultants out there, and I would do informational interviews with them. I would I definitely uh, subscribe to the Chronicle on Philanthropy. Your state in Minnesota, we have a Minnesota Council on Foundations and a Minnesota Council on Nonprofits. Look to those organizations in your state to see what might be available. Sometimes there's actually RFPs, requests for proposals out there. So there, there are a lot of places to start. You'd also want to think of within fundraising, what is your niche? Because I don't know many fundraisers who can do everything from plan giving and endowments and grant writing and special events and individual major givers. So what is your niche? And again, as, as Fred said, what is going to be, how might your work really help that organization? What do you bring to it that's going to make a difference to them? That's a start. You can always email me and we can chat online as well. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And it looks like we're just about at the top of the hour. So, um, Nicole and Angie, would you like to wrap up the webinar? Sure. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, some phenomenal questions coming in. Okay, so we've put together a list of consulting resources, hopefully to piggyback upon um, all of our presenters' resources. So some small business support, um, the U.S. Small Business Administration and SCORE, I would definitely highly recommend. Uh, in most major cities and states in the U.S., they have those and offer training and even mentoring. A lot of that is free of charge. And by the way, this resource list will be included on our website um, on the archive webinars page and we have a continued list of resources of some industry professional associations to join um, around the area of professional consultants and a few list of consulting pe publications in e-magazines also and a final thought for today you are surrounded by simple, obvious solutions that can dramatically increase your income, power, influence, and success. The problem is you just don't see them by Jay Abraham. So again, we uh, want to sincerely thank all of our speakers, uh, Gary, Kelsey, and Miriam, and Fred, who joined us today. Um, hopefully everyone enjoyed the webinar and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much.